Hello and welcome back to Coin Scrum Markets. I'm delighted to be joined today by Shah Ramazani, CEO and co-founder at NOAA. Hi Shah, thanks for joining us. How are you Paul? Great to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Always good to see you. Good to catch up. Um, I'm really keen to um, let our audience hear a little bit more about what you guys uh, are working on. Um, just recently coming out of stealth, I guess, but I think it's quite a topical uh, and timely time to have this discussion, given some of the uh, recent activity we've seen, especially around news from El Salvador, uh, you know, nation states looking to adopt um, Bitcoin as an alternative currency. Um, and you know, one of the things that's always been a point of discussion in crypto since I remember the very early days when I was around, um, that you know, Bitcoin or you know, the, the idea of, the block, of blockchain um, would hopefully uh, act as a, a, a springboard for some, some underdeveloped economies to kind of uh, revive their banking infrastructure um, and potentially act as protection maybe against some of their weaker economies and currencies. You know, and you know, certain projects started addressing that or looking to address it early on, but it was very early days. I think now over the last few years, as infrastructure has matured and awareness has grown, um, you know, we're seeing these uh, topics come back into discussion. Um, and I think this is what you are obviously looking to tackle at NOAA. So, um, you, know, you, you I think you pitch yourself as a crypto native bank and really looking to serve the underbanked uh, across the globe, um, which is obviously a very um, uh, noble objective. Um, but keen to hear your thoughts on, you know, why, how, how the project came about, who you've teamed up with uh, to start working on it, uh, and a little bit about what you see as the opportunities are now. Sure thing, Paul. So let me first give you a brief intro into NOAA, so for everyone who doesn't know about us. So, you know, I'd like to start with our mission statement. So we are on a mission, I would say, to put digital money into the hands of the next billion people um, and in emerging markets uh, specific, specifically. And by focusing only on the real, you know, benefits of cryptocurrency as opposed to the, you know, uh, I would say trading and speculation aspect. Now, how do we achieve that? Um, and this is, you know, purely by only concentrating on what the underbanked always wanted to do. Um, they wanted to always have a single place where they can store value, uh, earn, you know, predictable, you know, yield, and you know, accrue wealth over time. Spend, send money around at almost no cost. Um, and that's basically like, you know, where our focus is now, um, NOAA is basically like the first, I would say, you know, crypto native bank that is, you know, coming up with a product, uh, towards closer end of this year where, um, people in emerging markets, um, can, you know, save uh, and store value, earn high interest rate, lend against their holdings as well as send, send money around, uh, for almost no fees and make payments to certain, um, uh, providers and earn cashbacks. So um, that's basically what we do. Now, um, what concerns the emerging markets? Um, now, why are we focusing on emerging markets? And that question has been, you know, asked a couple of times. I think people have the notion that this is like the smaller size of side of the market, and the kind of UK and US is bigger. We would, we strongly disagree. I mean, we already see the data. Nigeria is already the second biggest country of the US in terms of trading volume, and the reason is that. We are solving a bigger problem there um, by you know, applying cryptocurrencies for day-to-day -day use cases, as opposed to um, speculation. People in those countries, uh, I mean, it goes beyond Nigeria, have very high inflation rates on their currencies, are mostly underbanked, I would say on average 80%, and um, you know, are, have difficulties in accruing wealth. Um, as you know, most of us um, you know, build wealth, not with our time or labor, we build wealth by saving, putting money aside and let capital work for us. But it doesn't work if you are in a country where, you know, inflation is between 10 to 20 percent, whereby, you know, you can't even access a bank um, and your other save savings alternatives are maybe your local stock market, which, you know, you don't want to invest, trust me that, um, you know, there is no proper governance structure and or uh, you know buy real estate but most of these people don't even have that uh, much money and don't forget that the credit system is not as far as advanced in, in western markets where they would be able to do so very efficiently so that's like in short um 
a quick intro uh, and you know about emerging markets, but I will obviously let you lead the way in terms of like going more and drilling down into some of the questions you want to ask. No, absolutely. I mean, if we if we compare it to kind of previous um, kind of waves of uh, technical innovation, um, I mean, you mentioned uh, like Africa there as well. Um, I mean, I think we saw uh, most of Africa skip a whole generation of uh, telecoms infrastructure. Uh, they didn't yep. have, they didn't have a, like landline infrastructure, and then they went managed to go straight to mobile. It was the right technology, easier for for them to adopt. Um, and became very, very prevalent and even supported many of their new payment systems out there as well. So, yeah. um, you know, they've, um, they've got history at kind of, um, you know, ad adopting new technologies and becoming very prevalent. Um, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty in the past. And you mentioned yourself about, you know, um, you know Bitcoin and other crypto assets are known to be highly volatile you know, in comparison to some of their local currencies, maybe less so than in uh, Western, more stable Western economies. Um, but you, know, do you, you said that places like Nigeria, trading um, activity is, 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 has become quite prevalent too. Uh, but more broadly, what are the signs that you see that, um, you know, the, the broader, um, broad, for broader adoption within those uh, types of regions? Uh, using this technology and what do you need to do when you're thinking about designing such an application to really make it um, user friendly and to enable that adoption? Yeah, so first of all, like there's a lot of data around uh, adoption. So you can, I mean, Statista has a couple of good surveys where I think 30% of the population at some, at some point, at some, uh, you know, in Nigeria has kind of bought or traded or dealt with cryptocurrencies and, you know, comparable to US, that would be 6%. Um, and same in Indonesia, like, you know, other emerging markets. So that's like, you know, number one proof point that, you know, adoption is already happening at much higher pace. So uh, no surprise. And, um, and um, the, other, uh, the other side, I think, is um, for us, you know, the, the app is, is, is very important to make it simple. Like right now, all the products you have right now, it may have, you know, products that are available or like your Binance's or your kind of like highly trading and speculation um, driven platforms that, um, you know, they're, they're kind of like, they have a different use case, right? But people use it because, you know, they, they don't have any other, other, other alternative. And our design and focus will be really even to go as so far up as not about even talking about the cryptocurrency, ideally, right? We just want to say what you can do with it, right? Because there is a, there, I mean, like it or not, there are some real benefits of cryptocurrencies as you know, the way it's structured. And one is, as I mentioned, you can save and earn predictably high yield. I mean, I'm not talking about Bitcoin, but like stable coins. And of course, you know, people can come saying, oh, it's not secure. Or like, what do you think about USDC? Or what do you think about this and that? Of course, we have solutions on that. But again, don't forget, we are comparing these problems with like the next best solution in Nigeria, which is, you know, the Naira. Uh, which is, you know, the government there is not perfect. So maybe the crypto solution or NOAA is a better form. And um, other than that, you can, you know, send money around very, very easily. You can do remittance. Again, you know, most of these people have even a USD ban. Uh, so they can't even like store too much a US dollar. Um, and um, so the, the whole application will be designed around use cases. Like, okay, so what can we do best with cryptocurrencies? So, and, and, and that's, that's it. And we really don't want to involve the, the user too much in the underlying technology, right? Um, because I think when you want to get Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, I think we have a very strong, uh, worth mentioning, we have a very strong Bitcoin maximalist view, is if you want to get it to the hands of the next billion people, you have to make it simple, right? You don't want to, you know, you don't want to be the IBM who is basically selling very complicated computers and you know, involving the consumer with all these different like RAM specs and I don't know, databases as opposed to like the Apple who comes in and says, okay, guys, like forget about the, whatever the, the, the details are. I just tell you what you guys can do with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've seen uh, some tightening um, across the globe um, around um, regulation um, and a big challenge for anyone that's been operating within the, in, within the industry um, that touches fiat rails, whether it's exchanges, whether it's people yeah. offering banking services, um, you know, th there's always been that friction there and uncertainty there. Um, is, in your view, in you know, for a crypto-native bank, is the goal that completely bypass the fiat system, 
Yeah. Um, and you know, we've got alternative versions of stable coins, whether they're fiat backed, which obviously yeah. does, does still you know, touch banking rails um, in some capacity. You've got um, the programmatic stable coins, which could have yeah. been completely bypass fiat banking system. Um, you know, if we're designing these things from the ground up, what 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 do you need to think about, and what is the long term yeah. vision? Is are we building something completely independent, or is it something that does need to integrate with the traditional financial rails? Very good question. So um, let me sub top down. So first of all, like I have a very strong thesis, like generally, like also within our company, is like we believe if there's really a, a solution people need and improves people's lives by 10x, no matter how many people stand in the way, it will always find its way. And that's, you know, I think everyone on Coin Scrum, they're fully like crypto native, they kind of believe that like, um, but yeah, there are different phases, right? So phase one is how do we bring on fiat and how do we enable people to buy crypto? Um, so for most countries, it's not, I mean, we have fiat to, uh, crypto gateways that we partner with. We don't want to touch fiat ourselves because it kind of slows down our growth. We have a global kind of view. Um, but then countries like Nigeria, where, you know, you kind of banned, um, is you need to become more creative, right? And there are different solutions. I think there are, one is, there is a lot of these agent models going around. As you know, the retail banking is not really, like the concept of retail banking is in Africa a bit different. So outside of Nigeria, Sub-Saharan Africa, everything goes through the telcos. So people buy these like top-up cars and you know, you know, phone up their mobiles. The mobile is kind of your, your kind of banking you know, application. And then the, the kind of, you know, I would say your 7-Eleven is your retail banking, right? Because they have like all these cars and they sell it. So, so we have to become more creative in the way we accept cash. We take cash and, and, and give people crypto. There are some, some thoughts out there, as you know, P2P networks can't be banned. Like that's like how people act. And, and this, there's a strong, there's a, I mean, people would, people underestimate that, but in Nigeria, the peer-to-peer -peer network is quite strong. Like, there are a lot of these people walking around who basically have a mobile, take your cash, give you crypto. So one of one of the questions that we have, you know, we're looking to is like, how can we get these people into our network? How can we build, a, you know, a, a kind of a, a network of freelancers or like agent operators who go there and help people to kind of unwrap? But right now, it's less of my focus in Nigeria. We will go there without accepting fiat and just asking people to deposit directly to our wallet because I know for a fact that they have a lot of alternatives where they can unwrap. But our solutions in terms of having the highest yield and the best security deposit um, is, should be so compelling that people actually are interested to send over these uh, cryptocurrencies um, to our, our wallet or Bitcoin and, and stable coins. Um, and I guess one of the common use cases um, in some of these economies um, is around remittances as well. Um, often yeah. um, have big overseas workforces that are sending money back home and I can yeah. value um, where you know this can a, reduce fees and um, you know offer some level of stability. Um, do you see because of some of these economies that you'll be like marketing to, um, are there any issues around that you might face around the capital controls with uh, funds always coming in or often coming more heavily in one direction versus the other? Um, yeah. So, so let me, uh, well, let's go to remittance. I just want to finish like off on phase two. So yeah, so, the, so because that's linked to remittance as well. So I really think uh, we, what we are starting to do as well with Noah is, well, you know, fiat is a, fiat on RAM is a big challenge, but like most people in those markets don't have much money, right? So what they're actually looking to do is making more money. Now in Nigeria or like uh, Lebanon, a lot of these people are starting to be net, you know, freelance developers, right? On Gigsters, like Andela. And the question for us is how can we enable the on on the on where they actually are conducting labor? Because then we don't never have the fiat issues, right? They, and that's the whole amazing thing about everything going on the cloud, everything being remote and, and having a global currency that the people can actually work for international companies because they're looking for, you know, hardworking individuals with the right mindset as well as like the right price and just get paid in crypto and never leave the, you know, never come into the fiat world only if they want to kind of like make the day-to-day -day expense, which they can, like we can enable that, but leave everything in a crypto native uh, environment. Like, you know, have most of the holdings in Bitcoin and stable coins and have them like at um, yields of like five to 10% and, and just, you know, use maybe our car payment system where they can basically just like, 
wherever they are, and, you know, get fiat or like even have it on credit, pay in fiat and then convert some of their Bitcoin holdings into that to kind of pay off. Um, now remittance, yeah, it's, it's a big focus for us. Like um, we are already like looking into a country which uh, potentially we'll be partnering with and that will be a big announcement. But um, that country, for example, 30% of the GDP is remittance. Um, but 30% of that country's GDP is literally people sending money back home and they're paying fees of 10 to 15%, right? And, and that's, that's quite a burden. Um, and we could do that much simpler with using the crypto rails. Um, now, concerning your question around, I think maybe if you mind repeating your question again, like your more specific questions around remittance, so I can best answer it. Yeah, but just um, on, on, on the subject of remittance, because I think we've seen this in the past when uh, some earlier projects um, attempted to set up some services. One of the challenges with remittances is, is that funds are generally, uh, you know, they, they operate through corridors and funds are generally flowing in a single direction. Um, yeah. Overseas workers might be sending their you know, yeah. earnings back home to family and friends. Um, yeah. Does that create any issues? So basically, yeah. when we look at these remittance corridors, you're absolutely right. Like if lower funds go from one direction to another, um, what we see is the biggest challenge is off-ramp, right? So on-ramp is easy because, you know, on-ramping into like, I don't know, some, you know, Bitcoin in London or like, let's say UK or US is almost a commodity, right? So that's like zero fees almost. But off-ramping is different. That's where we need the government support. And in some of those countries I mentioned that we're looking to partner with is specifically we're talking with like the embassy and then kind of like the local authorities to be allowed to open a local bank account where we can store a USD and we can basically enable off-ramp, mm -hmm. right? And at, at more like, not like an agent peer-to-peer -peer like shady way, but in an official way uh, and at, at, at very low fees because the main fee is the off-ramp. It's if it's not efficient and if it's not like properly done mm -hmm. or like not at high volumes with you know, proper liquidity systems, it's, it's going to be too high. Um, so that's what, what we are working on. And, and um, again, some remittance corridors are already well done. I think US, Mexico is doing quite well. So that's not much to do there. But others, yeah, there is a, a lot of work to be done. And that's where we are like, interested to like work with um, the local authorities. Now, of course, you ask yourself, like, what's in it for them? And, and I think, it's, I think it's what you will see over time is that people will realize that crypto is here to stay, like Bitcoin is here to stay. Now, either I'm going to be smart and be like the US, which kind of never banned the internet early on and kind of supported and, and, and benefited from the rise of Google, Facebook, and all these different uh, companies, and you know, obviously from tax revenue. Or I'm going to ban it and risk that my neighboring country is going to adopt, right, and be more popular. Because it's, no matter what you do, it's here to say that so there's going to be some inter-country uh, competition. And a lot of the smaller ones, especially, you know, they kind of look up to Estonia and all these, like, smaller countries, which manage to turn around their, you know, um, countries in terms of, like, bringing innovation. You know, first of all, a lot of these people were, like, working nearshoring, you know, for nearshoring companies in, in Europe. And then the second order effect was a lot of these people became founders and you have bold, like a couple of unicorns now in Estonia. And when we have these conversations, they're all looking towards that. And, and having the opportunity to be kind of like get some El Salvador-like news where they're like, oh, we are very favorable towards technology. We're very favorable towards cryptocurrencies. Brings a lot of foreign investment and attention. Uh, so that's where we see some of the smaller countries being interested to get a heads up um, versus the neighboring uh, com competitors. Mm. I mean, the, the, I mentioned the, the, the top of the interview, um, you know, the recent news from El Salvador. So it seems to be like a good test case and maybe a first step that other countries might follow. Um, what insights have you gained from what's happened out there uh, on the ground? And quite often, you know, the naysayers in the West will still continue to say you shouldn't be pushing these highly volatile assets on, you know, uh, kind of less well off people in these poorer countries. Um, yeah. You know, what is from your research? How knowledgeable are people on the ground? You know, beyond those that are potentially just using it for speculation and a small number of people. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, using it as an inflation hedge. Um, it, uh, you know, is this too soon still, or do you just, from your research, do you think that the understanding has has grown to a point where those risks are kind of reduced enough? 
So I think you asking about how knowledgeable people in emerging markets generally, like those some markets uh, are about cryptocurrencies or like financial, um, you know, mainly financial related uh, crypto. Um, yeah, you would be surprised. It's very counterintuitive, right? Um, they're very knowledgeable. They're more knowledgeable than I would say in the West. I guess some of them is because unemployment, you know, um, especially in Nigeria, like 30% of the youth is unemployed. And, and they're very, very knowledgeable because it kind of, when you see such a great wealth generator, you know, passing by and people talking about this, it's a huge network effect, right? Money itself has a strong network effect. Um, and, and they have all the means to educate themselves, right? I mean, all you need is like a mobile phone and like you, you access the whole world. So you often end up seeing people extremely educated about these uh, products, uh, these technologies and, and the benefits. And I think part of it is also because I'm, I'm Iranian myself is people are generally more knowledgeable in those markets in how things work because they can't rely on anyone. They can't rely on the government. They can't rely on the currency. So they kind of know what's happening behind the scene. And, and they kind of see also the vision of why this would be a better solution, right? Whereas I think in, you know, I was brought up in Switzerland, like everything is perfect. I never question anything in the government. It's kind of taking it as, as a status quo. So I think people have a hard time to see why this would be a better system because this current system works for them. Or, you know, if the crypto would be, would be, would be adopted, would be like three X better. And that is not enough for people to kind of change behaviors. Um, so uh, people there definitely are very knowledgeable. I also had this conversation with multiple people who then ended up emailing me and said, oh, you would be surprised. I'm sitting in like Lagos in a taxi and the guy literally talking me through all cryptocurrencies, like what's happening, Solana, all these different projects. You'd be surprised. Like people, are, it's a religion there. It's literally a religion. It's like the answer to all the problems. Like for decades, centuries, they've been kind of these disadvantaged people, never had the opportunity that the West had. And for the first time, not only the educational aspect, but also like the monetary, you know, having, having yield at a Western standards, being able to invest in things that, you know, uh, everyone in the West can and having the same opportunities is kind of extremely like you get some emotionally. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And, you know, what do you do though? I mean, if this does become more prevalent with types of moves that we've seen in El Salvador. I mean, you know, that's kind of one initial case. You saw some murmurings, some comments from the US, you saw some comments from the IMF. Um, do you see any risks that if more countries openly um, and at a, you know, a, a government level um, start to support the growth of these things, do you think there's gonna be some react, or, you know, more of a reaction from countries like the US to that? Uh, in the past have put pressure on these countries around sanctions, around the SWIFT network, uh, and they've easily been able to, you know, put their kind of the, 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 yeah. the financial pressure on them. What do you see that reaction might look definitely. like? How do you see that reaction looking like and in the future? Definitely, and we, we also expect it. Like, I think one of the countries I told you about, uh, the smaller ones, is around, you know, kind of like ex-Soviet country, and I think one of the biggest fears there is like, um, you know, Russia will come and intervene because a lot of that remittance is, is like Russia's corridor and Russian banks. Um, definitely, like we, I think, you know, um, we'll see that. But as you know how these, all these like disruptive technologies, the way they work is, is like they creep, 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 and suddenly it hits an inflection point where it's too late, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think our strategy is that, like we just, you know, keep on going low profile, keep on like improving people's lives. Um, even with that remittance corridors we're talking about, we just said, look, let's pilot, worst case, you know, you guys are gonna have is, you're gonna have some news, you're gonna have some awareness because again, like think about a country as a business, right? They're like, no one knows about our country. Like not even like there's direct flights from London to, you know, that country. And I was like, yeah, you know, you gotta build up awareness and you can definitely use the crypto as kind of like a jump for that. Um, so you can like trial and then, you know, you have people knocking on, on, on the doors. And then the, I think we have less this kind of pirate approach where we like, you know, forget about, governments let's like screw them we want to really like bring everyone on board we want to bring i think um a, a role of a great leader or someone who wants to bring like a, a great mission to the world is like bringing all parties to the table right of course they have some concerns but also they will also benefit from some areas right so uh we see how we can best you know kind of facilitate those and make sure that at the end of the day the people benefit and they are forwarded the the kind of um all the benefits of like using a you know crypto native uh, financial system 
Okay. Um, and having the vision of onboarding the next billion people, again, is a noble one. Um, and you mentioned, you know, um, you know for, for such platform or platforms such as these to be access, uh, successful, um, the, you know, the complexity really does need to be pushed under the hood. Um, are, is, is the industry ready and is the technology ready to be able to support banking services uh, on crypto networks for a billion people? Um, what are you guys looking at? What's interesting you in terms of current yeah. technologies, emerging technologies that are going to help this scale um, to that level? Uh, I think it's definitely ready um, now. Like, I think what we're competing in against are, you know, I think some of the interesting things that are happening with fintech. I feel like, you know, fintech is basically like an interface, a nicer interface on top of the existing infrastructure, right? And, you know, we're still using like centralized clearing houses and like huge fees, like, you know, you know, mainframe databases. So, um, and, and I really, I have a very strong conviction that that, like that particular innovation cycle where like, let's say beautiful interface on existing systems, like, you know, make onboarding easier and all that stuff will go down in history as a short innovation cycle. Like it's very similar to, uh, maybe not that similar. I mean, that was an extreme example, but basically like, the facts, the colored facts printing, uh, or, or whereby it was here for five, 10 years, but an email took over everything. Why do we need papers? Why do we need that? Um, now coming to the, if it's ready, of course there are challenges still on the scalability and some of the aspects, but you know, we are not onboarding right now on billion people, maybe in the next you know, five years, that's our mission. But, but by the way it's moving right now and the pace and you know it yourself, like the community and the, some of the smartest minds are working on it. We can expect that it will be, you know, getting ready very quickly. So we want to have the right, uh, uh, right place in the market and also the right exposure. So we kind of like grow whilst the technology also becomes more mature, right? I think there's a lot of stuff happening currently that is exciting. And the more, and it's kind of compounding, right? The more people enter, the more it takes uh, um, attention, the more engineers enter the world, like the community keeps growing. People are working on different solutions. More venture funding is coming. So like expect this in five years to be fully like, um, you know, ready for, you know, on board like the world. Yeah, yeah. No, we can see that. We can see the pace of innovation. Um, you know, I guess um, uh, second layer solutions, we're talking about Bitcoin, um, yeah. you know, the Lightning Network is continuing to grow, whether it's the right technology, we'll see, but, um, you know. But even uh, that, like, let's say Lightning Network, right? Um, people work on this, they know about the challenges, mm -hmm. but then there are like 50 different other projects who are like, we could build a better version of Lightning Network. And that is only possible if the community is big, more people are entering the crypto scene, more people are making money from it in terms of like raising funds, mm -hmm. um, seeing it as an opportunity. So that will only accelerate, like just, you know, in a massively compounding way. Yeah, yeah. So tell us who, who are, um, tell us a bit more about your co-founders and who else you've got working on the project with you. And uh, how did you come up with the name Noah? So, yeah, so basically, uh, that was credit to my co-founder, uh, Manny. So basically, uh, we were, we're sitting in the room and we were like, okay, so we want to build like a global brand and global business. So we need a global name. Um, and um, we also need a name that was like socially acceptable, is acceptable in all, all kind of markets, like Muslim countries, you know, um, Israel or um, uh, Christian countries. And, and, and Noah, it's finally a name that, um, you know, it comes in all these religions and it has also very aligned with our mission, right? So it's about helping people. And, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, Noah's Ark, the flood is coming. The flood for us is kind of the government's printing, uh, printing away, like a third of the US uh, USD currently in circulation has been printed the last 12 to 18 months. Um, so the flood is coming, you know, join the Ark, join Noah.com. Um, and we were also lucky to kind of like buy Noah.com at a very early stage. Uh, I think having a good domain for a, for a consumer facing brand is, is extremely important. Um, and um, yeah, it's basic, you know, and, 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 that, and that came very quickly. And I think we got, a, we got the name quite right and we're happy about it and everyone kind of gets it. When we talk about Noah, like they just get it. Now, uh, yeah, so we are two co-founders here. It was uh, me and Manny. Um, Manny has, uh, has spent previously, he built a hedge fund called uh, Kingsway Capital. Um, and he has, you know, spent a lot of time in emerging markets, traveled, I think, in over a hundred of those markets, invested in a lot of these businesses. Um, I think his fund is at 4 billion AUM right now. 
and now he's looking to be more like allocate some uh, more of his time into the mission um he has a very humanitarian approach as well uh similar to me and because we both me being iranian uh seeing you know seeing those markets as well being i also had a startup before in uh in middle east which i exited we both understand and uh, understand those markets very well as well as have the right contacts the right exposure you know the right you know fintech companies crypto companies to kind of accelerate that mission very quickly cool. well look Shah, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today and hearing uh, more about the project. Um, I think, you know, the next few years, the timing does seem right now that these things um, yeah. are ready to be adopted. Um, I think we've seen, uh, you know, uh, quite often that, um, you know, wave one or possibly wave two uh, of no, new, product, in new technologies are just, it's just about timing. Uh, and it just feels now that the time is right for us to it's be one hundred percent. It's going to be it's going to be very disruptive in the emerging market. I think also the last Bitcoin Miami conference, like a lot of the emphasis, also from you know Jack Dorsey, has gone towards you know Bitcoin and 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 um, uh, emerging markets. Look, it's similar to China, right? Two thousand six, when this first SARS uh, COVID you know, virus hit. People like, you know, institutions like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley were selling off the stocks on Alibaba, you know, Tencent, they were like selling because then the stock market crashed and they kind of saw, you know, Amazon's taking off and like retail taking off, retail e-commerce taking off. But there was one thing that they forgot in the equation. I, I don't think they forgot, but they kind of like didn't emphasize it equally as strong is that, hey guys, like in China, there is no retail penetration. Like you don't have Walmart and you don't have Costco's. So what you do with e-commerce is you open the floodgate to consumerism. So you're unlocking so much more value to the people. And the same mentality goes to emerging markets. Like just imagine these people, they never had banking systems. Like, and, and a lot of the success that we have in terms of having companies, you know, uh, growing companies, like maybe, uh, you know, uh, and all the industries that are expanding is with the backbone of a proper financial system, which makes sure capital is allocated at like places where it has the highest returns, people get credit, um, and that doesn't exist there. People don't have capital, and and it, and if if they have, it gets printed away. Yeah, yeah. No, we can see history repeating itself in many ways, and I think it's you know it's just very common, isn't it, that um, uh, people in like these mature economies just just assume that the world looks like theirs um, and uh, ignores that the, the world's a much bigger place and, uh, and there's, yeah. there's more pressing issues for other people. Yeah, and don't forget, like, I always like to say that, because um, I, you know, I hire a lot of people around the world and I always see the same mentality or like same thing. Every, every nation is born stoic I, and, you know, dies away ephemeral. Um, I think it's, it's a saying by Ayn Rand. Basically what it means, like, those markets are hungry. People were waiting for opportunities. I've been, you know, before working for the Hutch Group, like running their Asia team, but a lot in China, like the way these people work, I mean, it's, it's scary. Like it's kind of how we were, you know, how the US was after the Second World War. Um, but once, you know, it becomes mature, people get lazy, but expect a lot of, you know, a lot of innovation can, can come from those markets if the people have the right opportunities in terms of like monetary system, in terms of education, in terms of access to jobs, which they will have soon uh, with like all these different remote platforms, which is great. And just just need a good, global currency so they can kind of like earn and, and save and invest maybe start companies later on um and and we see countless of examples of these uh, in those markets and that will again this is a compounding thing it's not like a linear growth of course you may have seen a bit here but expect this like to like 10x in the next five years as well yeah well we uh certainly hope that you'll be supporting that type of growth um, Thanks thank a lot, Paul. for joining us today, Shah, and we'll certainly touch base with you um, again at a later date to see how things have been developing. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thanks. Cheers.